Welcome to the podcast today, guys. Today we're tackling a fun topic and something a lot of us have experienced through our training history, back pain. And we're joined by a really cool guest that specializes in this, Paula Basilio from My Back Relief Chiropractic Clinic. Um, welcome, Paula. We're a pleasure to have you. Just tell us a bit about yourself, mate. All right. Thanks for inviting me, guys. Pleasure. Uh, so my background is that I've been in practice for 10, 11 years now. Uh, originally practiced in Brisbane, now here in the inner West Sydney. I guess my background is that, like everyone, when we were 17, didn't really know what we were going to do. Uh, so chiropractic came up, and I didn't realize how amazing this uh, profession is. So I started getting that uh, kind of passion for it when I realized how much it could help my family. So my mom so, had a disbulge in the neck nice. and um, changed my family, changed my perspective, changed my philosophy on health and pain. So did you and treat your mom? No, was definitely that? not. I was a student. Oh, <laughs> she went to yeah, 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 she yeah. went to a Cairo herself. So, yeah, so she was on the verge of getting surgery. Oh wow! Yeah. So um, definitely, I know what it looks like to see pain that is debilitating. We're going to be talking about low back pain, obviously today. But um, my mom's one was her neck, and um, just seeing the change in her, but also the ripple effect into my family. That's why I like talking about it so much. Wow, it's always it's always nice when you've kind of you, you, or not nice, but when you've experienced it yourself, and it just gives you so much more that you can relate to your um, your uh, your clients with as well, right? Yeah, hundred percent. So uh, my philosophy, and when I talk to a patient, pretty much uh, when I give them advice and uh, advise what it is, adjustments, exercises, whatever it is, uh, it's almost like I superimpose my family's face onto that person. <laughs> Oh, and um, and just make sure that whatever I say is the truth. Um, and it would be what I would want a practitioner to do for my family. So. You um, you did you just mention this just then, or did we? Was it where only when we spoke about this before the podcast that sixty percent of people actually at, at least assist sixty percent of people at least experience uh, back pain in their life? Yeah. So statistically, um, throughout someone's life, sixty uh, percent of our population it could be different from now. Uh, will experience low back pain at some point. Um, neck pain and back pain are the highest reasons for people taking days off work other than the flu. Uh, and one of the lead causes of disability uh, in our community. So it's a really important to topic to talk about because it kind of seeps into everyone's um, daily lives, their quality of life. How well are they surviving, but not only surviving, but thriving in their life. In in your experience, what what would you think is the main reason? Like I I know it's very hard to say. There's so many things that come down to pain, but in your experience, uh, like and with trends that you see, and just like like at your clinic, what do you think the main reason is that people do experience low back pain? So to look at um, the trends for back pain, you kind of need to look at the trends for the healthiest parts of the world. So uh, if anyone has, have you guys ever heard of blue zones before? Uh, no, but go. Blue zones. So blue zones are, um, if you look them up, they've done twin studies on this. And these are the happiest, healthiest people in the world. Low diseases, low, low health problems, um, live to a very, very old age, healthy. Um, and uh, they've kind of dissected a few things, but uh, essentially... There's a lot of modern day stress that we put on ourselves that uh, we weren't originally uh, <laughs> we weren't originally made for. So these blue zones are essentially places that hasn't been touched by Western world. Um, can you name some blue zones off the top so, of your head? Uh, there's a place in Japan uh, where I'm not sure one of the islands where uh, people live uh, regularly above the age of ninety. They have good social uh, standings. They have the community that they grow up with. They live a happy, healthy life where they're moving around. They're eating the food that is made from the soil that they're from. Um, they're not stuck in jobs like us. <laughs> I, I think if if you look at the way that we live, um, and I'm not moving out of Sydney, <laughs> obviously, um, but if I even dissect the way that I look at my son, he's taught to sit down at school all day long. Um, iPads are part of their homework now. Tech is part of our life. We're not getting rid of that. Um, but to understand why we're at certain health crises, we also have to look at 
uh, what the opposite is and what uh, what it looks like for facts and lifestyles to look healthy. Yeah, I absolutely love that. And a few things that you've just mentioned there really um, resonate with me because first of all, you you brought it up without saying it, but it's the biopsychosocial model where you look at you you mentioned how these um, this island in Japan or this place in Japan, how they have these nice local social networks. Um, obviously, we kind of know like Japanese food is normally pretty good, and the Japanese have a, have a nice high um, life expectancy. And um, like obviously, the psycho psychology of it as well is like, and I, I appreciate massively that my job is movement, and I, I, I it's a really hard in my job to say to people like, oh, you need to be moving more, you need to be moving more, because experiencing it like a, in the in the partner, like she sits down for very long periods of time that's just her job and how important it is to get up and to move around but we are so lucky having a job where we actually move around quite often and most people are like they're forced into a position where they don't and then you mentioned that how they also they eat from their like they eat from their social network as well so they they uh, pretty eat for their local produce and very closely grown to them where we do a very opposite thing where I've spoken about this a little bit, and I know this is a bit of a segue, but I think it's so interesting how the Australian soil is some of the worst soil in the world, because it wasn't designed for um, it, it wasn't designed for this kind of more Western way of. First of all, the Western foods don't fit in the soil because it has a very thin topsoil. Second off, our, our Western ways of like digging up soil don't suit the actual foods that are supposed to be growing in it. So you mix the topsoil up, and it's, it's really interesting, isn't it? It's like how how much comes to um, how much comes into actually people living a healthy life. And I love how you've gone there from back pain. Yeah. Right? Like so it, if, if we're going from the soil point of view, Australia has one of the uh, poorest nutrient um, rich soil. So if you take a look at um, something as basic as magnesium, magnesium is an essential part for making muscles relax, including low back muscles. Yeah. Um, no magnesium muscles cannot physiologically relax. Uh, we cannot produce magnesium in our body. We have to get it from an outside source. Most and, of the outside sources is soil. Yeah, and while so, we also don't um, don't produce it ourselves, we yeah. also lose it at a really fast rate. 100%. So it's not that we just have to take those stuff. We have to be continuously supplying ourselves some sort of magnesium that's not coming from the soil. It's, most people should be getting it from somewhere else, right? Because every time we sweat, it's magnesium. And I think it's also really interesting that you mentioned how like it controls our muscles. Because it controls everything. It controls how our brain literally wires to our body. Because if it's a, it's an electrolyte as such, right? So it is, yeah, incredibly important. I didn't think this was going to go to nutrition, but I, I, I love where it's going. I'll, I'll bring it back. Um, so with the Blue Zones, taking a fair bit from the cultural influences through the Blue Zones, the community group, like uh, the daily stress has been removed and that sort of stuff. What type of, what type of information are you taking out of this and then imparting into your practice? And, and what type of lessons are you trying to impart um, with your clients, especially in the in the realms of back pain. All right. So uh, I guess there there's a few things that we we focus on with our patients. So uh, with our patients, we need to first understand the environment that we live in, and uh, and what we were genetically trained to do. So understanding that you as a healthy person uh, have a few elements to you that creates your health and your back pain. Yeah. So that may include your genetics, your environment, and your lifestyle. Now, I'm not going to change my genetics, because apparently I can't. But we can somewhat change the environment, but not completely. So when we look at our patients, we look towards influencing their lifestyle the most, because that's what we have the most influence in. And I think that's probably the most empowering part of it, is when people are in disability, uh, disabling back pain, uh, it can get to that point with, oh, I can't do anything. Nothing's going to help. But when you realize that you are 100% responsible for you and you do have the ability to make changes, even if it's 1% changes, those 1% changes over time accumulates to something that can actually make you healthier in the future. Yeah, that's beautiful. And the, the idea that um, like, however painful pain is, is that, that learning about pain reduces pain to a a big amount as well right like so actually understanding that the pain is necessary and how like you're not going to ever live a life without pain so when you do experience when you do experience pain kind of like the more understand you have towards what pain is the more you're actually going to be able to handle it therefore you can make them lifestyle changes with yourself with 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 pain and lifestyle what do you think are the main 
uh, things that you can implement with someone or make a kind of like a psychological change to actually get them to take it into their own, like actually walk away and make real life changes? What are the main things that you implement with people? So uh, we look at uh, the three main stresses that uh, the body is subject to. Uh, so that could be your mental stress, your chemical stress, which is something that we talked a little bit about, and then your physical stress. Um, with a chiropractic office, it's always easy to implement physical stressors and um, modifying that and obviously working with coaches like yourselves and modifying the physical stressors and getting them stronger in that way, um, but also addressing the two other stressors at some point during their care and just making sure as an all-round person uh, they start to move towards a healthier life. Um, if we look at the definition of health itself is kind of like every cell, organ, and tissue in your body is um, optimized. It, it's almost not attainable, but moving towards it is probably a, a better stance on it rather than trying to get it. Um, that, that point that you made on uh, pain and pain as part of your life, I find that really interesting because I do have a lot of patients that um, will always ask our patients what their goals are. And one of the goals that constantly comes up is I want to be pain-free for life. And I always approach it from the stance of uh, that would be equivalent to someone saying, I never want sadness in my life. Um, and we know that sadness is part of life because it makes you a person. Pain can sometimes be part of your life. Obviously, you don't want to be in chronic pain. Um, and you can modify uh, your neurology or your phys physical self for that. Um, but understanding that uh, you on some level can't control all the time that aspect of it, but you can control all of those lifestyle factors. And that's where the focus should be. Yeah, I, I love the holistic approach, definitely. And it's 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 that, that kind of... Uh, the way you're mentioning how happy and sad as well as like pain and pain, pain free is really interesting, especially because um, like with happiness, the happy you get, your, you adjust your setting for happiness. So something just slightly lower is painful or sad, right? And I suppose with, with people who, are, who experience pain, when we're in the gym and we're training, like to get as far away from pain as possible is to be very adaptable and you have to push boundaries and you have to challenge things. And and that's where pain can show itself the most as well sometimes as well when you have pushed the boundaries in one direction too far. And like kind of with what you're saying is with all this holistic approach of looking at pain from so many different factors, you don't know which one at what time. Because pain when it is received into the body is not, uh, stress when it's received into the body is not then broken up into different pots. It's not then said, okay, well, this is a uh, gym pain and this is social life pain. This is your, this is you break divorce in your wife pain. It just comes into the body and it becomes a stressor. It becomes kind of like, you can look at it like as hormones and receptors and stuff like that. And the issue is, is that what, when we're doing one thing, we don't know that we're not overloading our bucket from another thing. So you do really have to look at it from such a, like a broad approach, right? It's really, really good. And I love how you've broken it down into them three things because, and especially you know what is controllable by yourself the most and what you can impact people with the most. That's fantastic. I'm curious, Paula, like when, when someone comes in and they do their goal setting, they do their initial intake, from a more of a biomechanical sense, what type of information are you looking to first capture to see what does this person, what do they or don't they represent? And what's your first initial intake process start to look like with someone that represents back pain? Uh, <clears throat> so uh, with anyone that uh, presents with us uh, with back pain, uh, we like to obviously figure out what they believe started their back pain um, and just make sure I understand uh, where that's coming from, their goals, obviously, um, but more importantly, how it is starting to affect their life. Because I know a whole bunch of people that live with pain but don't take action on 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 fixing it. So, um, if someone's been having twenty years of back pain, why here? Why now? What's that motivating factor? What is it that you can't do now that you used to be able to do, or is what is that that you would love to do? You're just not achieving it. So I want to know what that is uh, because someone having goals uh, is one of those things that it just moves the needle forward. If you have no goals, nothing's motivating you to actually get out of the situation that you're in. 
if that makes sense. So uh, we'll go through that process. Uh, I guess the examination that I do, there's that biomechanical aspect to it, but we delve definitely into the neurology of it. Uh, we do a lot of balance tests, um, see how your nervous system is working, uh, because essentially your nerves, at least in your lower limbs, you guys deal with squats, lunges, you'll see people off balance sometimes. Uh, essentially, those nerves that uh, go to your muscles to control it, uh, you also need nerves to tell the brain where your, where your limbs are. So it's a completely integrated system where um, the brain is constantly communicating to the body and the body is constantly communicating to the brain. And any fault in that system can create imbalances and any imbalances creates overload into certain joints and areas in your body. And a lot of times we don't even know that we've got this. So uh, we do that and then we take posture photos and not from an aesthetic point of view. I think whenever I see patients, they're like, oh no, look at my weight, no. <laughs> so we're looking at it from, uh, and one of the most common postures we start to see is that um, the patient's body starts to move forward. Um, and if we look at our daily lifestyle, a lot of us, it, it's our phones, it's our computers, it's everything that's in front of us and we're just more veered to just leaning forward constantly. I guess the problem with that is that um, the more you lean forward, the more pressure on your discs in your low back. And those discs are pain producing structures. Um, and the more that we wear them away, uh, the less space that we give those nerves uh, and the more potential pain that you experience. And then post that if there's any warrant for it, then we take those x-rays and we marry all of that information together and figure out what's right for this patient. Yeah, we, we see that a lot. We, we, we tend to find that, and, and the reason behind it is that, that we, we see a lot of people falling forward, like move, slowly dragging forward into their toes. And if you look at like, um, you could kind of look at it from a stress perspective as well. Most of what we do throughout the day, yes, well, we have phones out in front of us, but we, before that we've had newspapers and before that something else, everything is always in front of us. But like you say, like our environments have got a lot more stressful. Therefore, we actually tend to spend more time rushing towards things. Or we're looking at computer screens where we are actually leaning. Like when you look at a computer screen and the typing is small on the screen, you don't just go, oh, I can just sit here and read it. You always drag your head in a little bit closer to read that. So being on the computer, we find that like, if you could look at it from a stress perspective, well, the higher stress you are, the more you're moving forward. And actually the less stress, the more unwinded you are, you're probably the more you're going to start coming back. But people are always in a rush everywhere they're going. They're always working at desks. And it is, there is a lot of like trying to take that time to re-allow people to open up that space behind them. Because over time, it does it closes up. The backside does close up a little bit. People end up too far forward. And then a lot of what we do here as well is that we're trying to give them the variability to get back. So the first thing we do is we do things with people to be like, okay, can we open up everything on the backside so that, and then give you options to like, get there and be there. and and slow down walking paces, make sure they are rotating side to side when they walk. Because a lot of it is that, is that when you're actually walking, you should be pushing forward on one side and landing on the back side of the other side and vice versa. And this is what we tend to see people like often lose. And like when, when we're looking at back pain from our perspective, well, some of the big anti-gravity muscles are the low back. Um, and once I am fully falling forward on my toes, one of the first things is actually gonna be my back that's gonna be holding me up right. And also it's, it becomes a mechanism. Like we see it all the time is when in, in gait, there should be this real nice equilibrium, this, um, this really nice like left side pushes, right side pulls, right side pushes, left side pulls. But quite often what we actually see is that the, the pulling and pu pushing muscles aren't actually working the way they should. And we find that the, the things that take up the pushing are normally the low back as well. So when my, when my glutes aren't so much as pushing me forward the way I want to, when I'm not using gravity the way I should, what actually ends up is the back starts becoming a glue or the back starts becoming a calf and, and likewise. Is, is this, cause like, so like obviously the biomechanics side of things inter like interests us so much. Is this, is this kind of like, is this, is this kind of like <laughs> That's what- 100% what I see. So um, when I talk to some patients that come from gyms and they're like, I've been working out my low back muscles um, and my back's really strong. I want, I want my back stronger. And uh, instead of stronger, it, it probably is that they, they want to be more stable and, and look at the core as in your diaphragm, your pelvic floor muscles, and your core. Sometimes there's an imbalance between all of that. Um, 
but yeah, definitely in the just the usual everyday stuff that we do, um, the walking. Um, a lot of people have uh, aberrant movements, so movements that aren't uh, what we would consider healthy movements, but just our walking patterns because of our lifestyle of uh, our sedentary lifestyle these days. Uh, but yeah, it's, it is just the small things that we do and taking notice of them. Um, I did this really weird thing one time. I just stood outside my clinic and I just watched all these cars go by. And I'm like, I'm just going to watch 10 cars and see how many people are actually leaning back into their chair and using the headrest. You know how many? I don't know how actually many. <laughs> one. Oh, one. Ten. <laughs> one out of ten. So if we're looking at that, it's, it's things that we're unconscious about. And if we make them a little bit more conscious, get the good habits later down the track, you don't even have to think about it because it's just become more of a natural part of you. Um, but even that and leaning forward and overloading those discs in your low back that put pressure on those nerves, leaning back, something as simple as that um, are small things that uh, your viewers can do to slowly get out of that pain. So would you, do you believe that there is a, a, a best posture? Like, or a best position to sit in or a best position to stand in? There's ideal positions. So um, if we're looking at ideal posture as such, um, it's your ankles are, uh, your knees are stacked on top of your ankles and your hips are stacked on top of your knees and then your shoulders are stacked upon that hip and then your ears are uh, completely stacked upon your uh, shoulders. Um, but always... The best posture is your next posture. Because even if you were to stay in that ideal posture for more than 20 minutes, something called creep starts to come in. And creep, I'm not sure if you guys have heard of creep before. Or we we, we discuss creep ourselves, but like I, I don't know if we use it the same way. We discuss it from how the muscles and tendons. Oh, cool. Kind of yeah. yeah. So yeah. Um, creep itself is uh, the amount of time until a ligament starts to deform. And uh, yeah. if you can imagine it, um, if you get a hair tie and you pull it and you keep it in that position um, or elastic band and you keep it in that position for a long period of time and then you let go of that elastic band, it just doesn't come back. So um, when we're talking about the human body, um, statistically, that number is around 20 minutes. So any time that you're in one position for longer than 20 minutes, then this uh, theory of creep starts to come in and your ligaments or your discs start to overload. So always the best posture is the next posture. Yep, I, I love that about creep. And I just one thing I will mention is creep is um, is uh, volume and load um, uh, changeable. So while it may be like, it depends on obviously the weight of the person and the type of tendons they have and the ligaments they have, that's always going to have an effect. And then in the gym, we can, we can manipulate it faster. We actually are in this block right now playing around with so creep. <laughs> So we're doing things like uh, isometrics or uh, very slow eccentrics to gain that kind of change of position between the muscles and, and the tendons. But yeah, I, I, that's a really nice, like, a nice idea. And I, I also, we also discuss about um, energy efficiency of humans because it's so interesting. Like we are trying to always be as energy efficient as possible, and we were always designed like that. We're so lazy. You, but we're lazy, a hundred percent. Yeah, you just put it, just say how it is, Paul. <laughs> um, and and quite a lot of like the, the cool thing about relying on tendons and ligaments is that they're they produce so much less power and so much less force and so much they need so much little, little less energy. So while, while that can make us really explosive and really athletic in, 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 a, in a sports performance kind of way, it can also be our downfall for positions we like to hang out in, right? So, yeah, so that's where the concept of the ideal posture even came from, is that, um, that ideal posture where everything's stacked up on each other um, very well, that's the least muscle activity comes from um, that posture. So you're not over-activating your low back. You're not over-activating your hamstrings. It's just, it's almost that relaxed position where the ligaments and the joints are doing what they're supposed to be doing. We use it um, as a reference point a lot, the stacked position to try and get someone into, maybe not to live into or anything of that nature, but to get into it's a baseline. It gives us more movement options with our body left and right, rather than that position we described earlier where that person's falling forward. If we can get someone into a stacked position, it's a nice starting point to then building variability in that person and teaching them more movement patterns that they can get into and have ownership of. And if they can have a bit of variability and access these different ranges, well, ideally, they've just got more movement, more shapes that their body can make and less restrictions. So I'd, 
it's the way we look in, in a lot of our movement patterns, whether it be a squat or a deadlift, the way we'll coach these type of positions is literally just to encourage and open up these spaces that they can take up these new shapes in. If they can have more movement, hopefully this just transfers into daily life, whether they're getting in the car door, whether they're picking up their kids or whatever it happens to be, they have access to these shapes that they've been facilitating in the gym and strengthening up these positions that they can use in real, real, real day life and feel comfortable with these positions rather than st staying in one stacked rigid position. Having this idea of, well, my understanding at least, of having this idea of that we must be in this one shape can be quite restrictive and can be actually take away a lot of movement options. So the space to get into this stacked position, but then also to shift out of it, to pull back into it and have this access to make all different types of shapes with our body can be one of the best assets that we have for uh, mobility and freedom of movement. Yeah, and even if there was a, um, a perfect position, um, the actual trust or the expectation for you to be able to explain that perfect per position to a person and then for them to take your words in and then organize their body in that way would be a, uh, I think, a nightmare because we're looking at the way people move and how they perceive their movement. And then we're also looking at um, what some people might not have available to them. And say, for example, I say this is the best position for you to be in. And at this current time, they don't have the certain movements to get into their, maybe the hips that are below back, their knees. Well, they're going to get around it and they're going to make it look like you, either how it sounds to them or what you've shown them. So it can be like, what well, I love what you said there. Where is the best uh, posture? Is your next right? I, I love that as a as a thought concept. So then, once we once we've done the screening, uh, wh where do you move with people next? Well, um, you guys explained it very well. Where some people really just can't get into that position, and you guys as coaches, um, you see it. And sometimes it's it doesn't matter how much you cue them; they're still struggling. And uh, there's that uh, ligamentous. There's that. Um, neurological um, part of it where they just can't activate yeah. those glute muscles, they can't activate those lower traps to get yourself into that um, shoulder position. Or structurally, um, some structurally. people were never designed for it. Like, yeah, and, then, alone, and there's yeah. a lot of genetic stuff out there. Yeah. If you see enough x-rays, you'll see um, you'll see a few genetic stuff that might be impacting some the way that people move. Um, and I guess that's where I come in as a chiropractor is that um, a lot of the times the first couple of treatments, I'm not giving them exercises. I'm not giving them that many cues, but I'm seeing that their posture, when we take a re-posture digital photo, they're changing their neurology and they're changing the way that um, their, their relationship with their body just based on adjustments. And then match that with really great coaching where you start to activate glute muscles, you start to activate muscles that just haven't been working or haven't been active in so long, um, then that's when someone actually starts getting stronger. And that's when that low back starts to become healthier. It has to be a marriage between potentially the passive care, but there has to be ha that active um, influence. Yeah, I love that because we see it all the time here as well. Like, so w say for example, there is a position we want to get someone into, we can't get then we, do, we don't lay hands, so we don't um, like organize them, we don't massage them ourselves. So then sometimes we'll use like a, a foam roller to do what we need to do or a band or a position or a breath of some sort to try and get the shape change that we want and then we'll look at it and see if we've created the, the, the space. So then what comes in really handy is someone like yourself, us being able to send someone to you where then they can have them adjust, adjustments made, that kind of muscle that needs to be down-regulated, reg, down-regulated that can't be done with the foam roller or with a band. Um, but when it comes to adjustments, actually adjustments that I think is probably the most famous thing about chiropractic, right? Yeah, so what, what, what's, actually, what's actually happening with an adjustment? So um, there's, there's been a few studies when it comes to um, adjustments and low back pain. And there's been a few studies with it. So I'll go through the pain first and then the performance mm -hmm. half of it. Um, so when someone has chronic pain, obviously there's brain changes. There, your perception of pain changes. Um, the way that your muscles work um, changes. So uh, on the most basic, basic level, um, say a joint is not moving, it's restricted, it's creating inflammation because it's just stuck, um, an adjustment will open up those joints. Um, but the research is starting to show that there's changes in um, how the brain perceives pain after adjustments. There's been 
uh, research about how it changes on just the spinal level, but also in the brain, um, centrally. And also chemically, um, different hormones are being um, produced when someone has an adjustment. So uh, there's a few layers to the adjustment itself and someone's perception. Um, from a performance point of view, I think they did this study with some Taekwondo athletes and it was a low back adjustment and their calf strength increased by 30%. So there's the pain half of it of opening up the joints, changing your neurology, changing the way that the nerves almost integrate and in how you perceive pain. But then it also has that performance half where um, say someone cannot activate those muscles, sometimes that, that nerve is there as a master control switch. Those nerves are there to activate. If you cannot um, utilize those nerves well, it doesn't matter how much I think it, that muscle will not activate. So essentially there, there's been research into that and I see it every day in practice too. No, we, we see it every day and we like, totally understand that. Like. At, at the end of the day, I think too often people are too concerned with um, making sure a muscle is working when a muscle is really just the, the slave to the joint position. So a muscle is not going to fire if your bones are in a certain position that they can't get out of. And I can definitely see how adjustments work towards creating some freedom of movement to then make adjust to make them make movement adjustments afterwards. Um, yeah, like I totally get that. And I think it's quite often muscles are too often blamed. Like actually, I think really all the time <laughs> muscles are too often blamed yeah. when is the glute the most accused muscle group of all time? I feel like everything gets blamed on the glute. At the moment, isn't it yeah. like the tib anterior? That's a, that's a new sexy bloody blame muscle. <laughs> is it? No, I think I think the, the glute trendy just, muscle. Just all the, as humans, I think we like to blame one thing. <laughs> yeah, this and, is the thing. And, yeah, and, yeah. We, and almost when yeah. when a patient comes and they're like, I blame that one time I I picked up that shampoo bottle. I'm like, oh, did you pick up that shampoo yeah, bottle or, before? <laughs> what, what about what about people blaming it on sleep? Then how how do you feel about that? Because I think that's an extremely common one. It's like kind of like, well, I slept funny and this this happened. I, I just it must be just my sleep. But sure, like if if you're blaming it on your sleep, then there's it, there's reasons why your sleep is um, bothering you and why a certain position in sleeping is going to bother you, especially if it's not. Like it's too acute if it becomes chronic from that, right? Yeah. So uh, if it's acute, that that might be a different story because if you can imagine, um, most people are supposed to supposed to sleep like that seven to eight hours. Um, Sydney siders, I feel like it's a little bit less. Um, but if you can imagine just putting your ankle in a really weird position, and then just keeping it in that position for seven eight hours, and just trying to move it, it's not going to feel good. So acutely, I can see how sleep um, position can affect it. Um, but even the, the sleep studies from chronic points of view, um, if you don't get to go into that deep sleep, if you're not getting your full um, eight hours with REM sleep, um, that's when the brain actually regenerates its nutrients. So without that deep sleep, you don't get to heal. So that's when it comes into almost that chronic section where um, you can focus on sleep, but again, it's only one other pillar of your life that you should be looking at um, uh, in your whole body. So it's still a very important part of your, your day. Um, it's like a third of your day, I think, yes, <laughs> or should be. Yeah, <laughs> I wish. That was a third of my day. <laughs> um, yeah, but, but with that in mind, like actually the actual, like people blaming sleep on or when it, they, so you, you mentioned how you're thinking about when people blame something on one particular time, but what about when someone blames that shoulder injury on sleep? Like, would you, would you say it was the sleep but that they slept badly or would you be more along the lines that some, there's more bigger precursors or other things that maybe cause this? Well, I'll, I'll never, uh, it's like when someone says that they're in pain, but there's no, I'm never going to deny that that's not the reason for it. Um, so it, it is their truth. Yeah. Okay, yeah, um, that, that, that sleep. So I'm not, not going to argue with someone that um, we just like to, yes, address that, adjust the postural stuff with sleep. And there's definitely um, good sleeping habits and bad sleeping habits, 100%. Um, but we still like to say, hey, it might have been sleep that you perceive it as, uh, but let's look at everything else and just yeah, make sure nice. that that stays healthy. Um, because that could also impact your sleep as well. So 
I definitely, um, I don't like making people wrong either. Yeah. And, and, and so, <laughs> but because no it is, every, everyone's truth is their own truth. Um, and and, lot, and that of, one yeah. with the shampoo bottle, it is their truth. Um, but uh, you know that there's other aspects to someone's life. So it's just about uh, slowly introducing that for them. I want to uh, go back a little bit. We touched chat, touch, a little bit of words. We touched on this slightly. I'd love to explore this a bit more. So we're talking pain and adjustment. So I'd like to go a bit more on adjustments because it's, as I said, it's like the the crux of chiropractic effort. And I love your holistic approach. The big part of chiropractic is, as I understand, when we make an adjustment, we're creating a moment in time where we can have more available range to this individual. So is is that what an adjustment be defined as? Just creating a freedom of movement with this joint for a period of time or an opportunity for movement yeah um, so uh, uh within the population there's what we call adjustments so there's called manipulations um and there's a distinction between them so uh with an adjustment it's a specific force into a, a joint segment um with the purpose of being therapeutic manipulations which would still make that cracking sound that uh, chiropractors are known for, is just a noise to a segment. So you can definitely have therapeutic changes, and then you can have ones where just someone's just making noise. So there is a slight distinction between adjustments and sometimes what some people might view as an adjustment, but is actually a manipulation. Um, when we're looking at the studies behind that, and they've done MRI studies of low back and adjustment pre and post, and what it looks like inside someone's body pre and post MRI. Um, and what they found was that there was a gapping in the joints um, post adjustment. It gives someone the freedom range, but also changes the way that those small muscle fibers that uh, are attached to that low back it's their tension point as well. Those muscles have to attach to something. So that quick uh, movement into that back resets that muscle and what it perceives as normal. Yeah. And, as, and while it um, resets what we perceive as normal, I, I see it from, from a really deep level. You're saying how it's tissue change, where it's a gradient change. So like at any point in the body, everything works on gradients. Like there's, there's high pressures, there's high volumes, and high pressure things tend to move to low volume things. And if, if I, for example, can't move a gradient around, so I can't move certain pressures from one place to the other, um, which the body would be wanting to, because that's, again, we, we can call it information, we can call it 50 different words, but it, it comes down to like ionic transfer chains. It's like the idea is that if I have an issue where there's too much high pressure in one place, well, actually a forceful push from someone from the outside can create a pressure gradient change that then pushes that kind of high volume into a, into a, another, a lower volume area. So actually, like a hundred percent, like it's been looked at from in so many different ways, like muscle massage. I think lots of the science behind it is still lost, and we're like people are really struggling to find like exactly what things are doing. <laughs> and then people go, okay, well it definitely works. Like, and there's a lot, there's a lot of um, there's a a lot of cause um to this this does work, this does work in the research. And most of it comes down to like that kind of basic science that we learn at school. It's kind of like the, them gradient changes and. We do it with foam rollers. That's like one of our ideas of when we're putting a foam roller in a certain place, the idea is that we're moving this, these high pressure areas that people can normally feel and we're moving it down into a, a lower pressure um, area. In that with um, the research that you're talking about, when it comes to health, um, the tricky thing about um, like chiropractic or physio or what works, what doesn't work, one is the... It's all the same the, at yeah, the end of it, the day. Well, yeah. In yeah. the end, you have multifactorial parts of your life. Yeah. The VAS, which is your pain scale, is subjective. Um, but also, for these to be the highest quality in research, you have to have something that's called a double-blind study. And that means that um, the patient doesn't know if they're getting a, a therapeutic treatment or not a therapeutic treatment. And also, the practitioner has to not know that they're giving a therapeutic treatment or not giving a therapeutic treatment. I would argue that in anything in health except for medications, that's almost impossible. Mm. Because if I were to do an adjustment on someone, I definitely know I'm doing an adjustment on them. So to have the highest quality 
in research study in anything in health other than like the, the medication, it's very, very, very difficult to do. So yeah, most of it has to be for exercise, right? Like that's where we have to go eventually. That yeah. One. Yeah. Can't, you can't always wait for science to kind of no, catch and, up, especially if we're going to be um, morally, ethically <laughs> <laughs> right with our, with our studies. Well, I, I think also um, the more that you delve into anything, um, when I first graduated, I was such an arrogant chiropractor. I thought I knew everything. I was like 23 <laughs> I'm like, I know all of this. The more that you delve into it and you think about it and you look at the research, the more that you realize that um, we have so far to go still. And that's in everything in health. And I feel like we only know probably 5% of what we should know about the human body, really. It's oh, such yeah, a definitely. complex, interesting structure. Like compared to some established uh, like science, like science, maths have been around for like centuries and this is still pretty new in like comparatively to like, like we talk biology and training and talk about adjustments. The information of this is so new compared to like maths, which has been around forever and a day and we've had centuries to build on it and evolve on it. So we're still in our early stages of learning how to do this and make it the most accurate process possible. And I 100% agree, this is only going to get better as time goes along. Technology gets better. Our, way to, our ways to measure get more accurate, get quicker, get faster. We're going to get better and better with this as um, as time goes on. Yeah, I think like everything in health should be um, changing and we should be changing our ideas or else we'd still be back in the days where every toothache is cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's uh, pretty accurate. It works pretty well. Yeah. And that wasn't too long ago, was it? <laughs> That's funny. Um, mate, I, um, so let's say, how would you how would you classify chronic back pain? So obviously there's, there's scales of pain, like you said, subjective scales of it. To someone that's got a, like a, a light irritants, to someone that is affected with most of their movement through a day-to-day -day effort, what does it look like for these two different individuals? Will, you, will they go through the same sort of process or will you have like a different kind of treatment plan for these two types of people? Okay, so um, it, to know what chronic pain is, you, you have to define chronic pain. So chronic pain is defined for a um, pain that's lasting more than three months. So that's the, I don't know if it's like two months and 30 days makes a difference from three months and one day, but um, uh, that's how it's defined. So anything above three months is considered chronic. Uh, when we're looking at it from a health practitioner point of view, um, anything past three months, what I view is that uh, your body has started to adapt in certain ways where it's no longer healing itself, that's getting all of these almost bad movement patterns, bad neurology that needs to be reversed. So, of course, from um, a practitioner point of view, as soon as we go into the chronic, it's a potentially a longer process than someone where they're like, oh, um, this is my first time I slept funny, and I've never had this before. It's so much easier to resolve than um, someone that started to get neurological brain changes about pain and slowly changing that. So like the, it's like their habits become their pain as well, right? Like like any habit that you learn, good habits or bad habits, the same thing happens with like with pain. Yeah. Uh, and and you learn these habits. Um, by the way, if ever you want to know what good habits is, you just look at your kids. Well, they have, well, <laughs> no, no, in movement, I want to say no, 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 my kids got some pretty <laughs> filthy habits. <laughs> Our kids are so Go back age. to picking no, up no, the no. Hose, you know, no, if, if ever you want to look at what picking something up looks like. If you look at a kid's squat pattern, they they bend their knees and they bend properly and they keep a neutral spine amazingly. Um, but, but, but kids have kids have um have so many more bones. They have uh, so much more. Uh, they haven't stiffened in their tendons yet. They have a head that's like three the times heads. the weight of their body weight. <laughs> like you've got like have you ever have you ever done a squat where you put a plate on your forehead? And squat down. It's like the perfect squat if you just make your head a bit of a, a heavier lever. Counterbalance. It's a, it becomes an amazing counterbalance. So kids do have a big benefit over us as as humans. We have they haven't stiffened up yet. They um they haven't even learned how like to how to manage gravity properly. Well, I guess that's what I'm saying is that um, neurologically they're very adaptable, right? Yeah. Bloody and oh. when do we lose that neurological adaptability? My I I question that it shouldn't necessarily be lost. Um, we inherently get bad habits, um, and I see it with, say, a two-year-old or a four-year-old, and then, um, say, their bones haven't even 
um, strengthened up to an adult bone until after they're 17. I see bad habits at seven. They should still have that same flexibility, but if they're bending over, I start to see seven, eight-year-olds start to bend over picking up things with horrible habits. And it's just our laziness. Let's go back to that, that we just inherently are sometimes lazy people, so we just go through whatever is not necessarily right, but what we just think and perceive is the easiest way to do something. I think uh, Keddy, Keddy Starrett, do you know Keddy Starrett? Have you heard of him? So he, he, he brought out a couple of books. He, does, he, he explains this really well because he brought out a bunch of books a, a, a while back and he, he was very much in the process of like kids are looked, and you said about seven, it's but kind of the stage where kids start getting sat down at school a lot, right? And they can't fidget as much and they're told to stay still for long periods of time. And that's when they start sitting at desks. And um, he, he had this big thing for a while where he was trying to get rid of all chairs in schools. And he did really well for a while. Yeah, and for some reason, he just was, fizzled out. Yeah, it, yeah, he, it, it fizzled out. But 100% like, and he, one of the big things he said is you look at a kid running, like sprinting 100 meters. And before they turn like seven, eight, and they're told to sit down for long periods of time, and they look really good, right? Um, obviously, this is when they're a little bit older and their bones have developed a bit more. And um, but then you take the kid after they've sat down for a couple of years and get to run, and they look horrible. <laughs> like so, it's quite amazing. But but also, if you like, I found it really interesting um, looking at the kids in our clinic um, before and after COVID, um, and in the middle of COVID, and how much uh, I would have been doing some posture photos on some of these. 10 year olds pre COVID and then six months in and just seeing the horrible habits that happened from that, just that inactivity. So um, a decent amount of this is stuff that we can control to some degree. Um, if you do have kids and, and it, you can control certain environments to, to facilitate that the healthier spinal movement. It's to your point here, Paula, we chatted with um, uh, one of our mates up North that runs a gym more tailored towards youth development and maybe not so much that we have so much exposure with here, but his lens is like, he's got kids that are like in their early teens that are constantly complaining now of lower back pain. I don't know about you, but as a kid, I felt invincible. Like I just used to play footy nonstop, run, climb, jump, all that. Never once had any lower back pain or anything of that nature. And for me, it just like, it's what just kind of blew my mind that he has a large portion of his kids that are like, I've got aches, lumps and bumps. I've got back pain. And, Kind of these, I don't know, were perceived as adult issues are happening at quite a young age, and that's oh, I find that just mind blowing. That that's a common thing at the moment, and and that's not only with low back. I think um, last week, uh, last year, my son was getting his eyes checked at an optometrist, and the optometrist said that she's starting to see a higher amount of um, kids getting glasses, just because uh, just things are changing. Where we're in front, they're no longer going out into the park and looking at trees and looking at distance anymore. They're just looking at the screen, which is one distance. And um, from a health perspective, what previously was, um, oh, you're just going to get glasses when you're older, there's just more happening at a younger age. But um, anecdotally, yeah, I, I see a lot more of it um, in our youth. And uh, there's been studies on even arthritic changes in the population. Um, and I think it was 2019 where, uh, and this is digressing from the low back, where they said, oh, there's horns um, in the back of our kids' heads. It was just um, this article where, uh, obviously, a sensationalized um, title. Um, but really what that was was a spur that was happening in the back of our kids' heads. And it's uh, suggested that around 50% of people will have it by the age of 18 to 30. So it's what just that? happening. I have, I have one in the back of my head. <laughs> Devil it's, like, <laughs> it's a devil job. Yeah, so it's it's just arthritic changes are happening at earlier times and um where typically you wouldn't see any degenerative changes until like closer to the thirties, you're starting to see it in eighteen year olds. As you're doing this, James keeps like touching the back of his head and just like freaking out. <laughs> no, I do, I have a little hook on the back of my head. <laughs> and I'm doing now. Oh god, that's a body protrusion. Of <laughs> <laughs> that's the normal protrusion. <laughs> Oh, it's funny. It's, it's pretty. Um, it's it's kind of it's sad in a way. Like all that discussion with kids and like mm. how how they are way more malleable like when they're younger. And it's kind of like um, it's kind of scary that they 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 get put into these regimes so quickly where they they get very routined and how they don't run around and don't open up their eyes to the full lens and how before they know it they start losing all the things they just don't do. And um, there's a, like a really uh like a guy that like I really appreciate in the industry called Bill Hartman, and he he talks about how how often he gets he gets kids brought to him. And they get they get brought up to him at the age of like 
four, five, uh, six, seven, eight, and so on. And he, they go, can you do uh, manipulations? Can you do these exercises on the kid? And and he goes, okay, um, let me just talk to the kid's father for a second. And he says, the kid, go over there, play with these kids, right? And they're, they're doing random stuff over there. And he talks to the father, blah, blah, blah. Then he calls the kid back over after 10 minutes. And he says, and they re rechecks the kid. And he goes, oh, there you go. The kid's fine. And it was just because he was playing really randomly. Whereas the kid was like putting him in strict like 100 meter sprinting. We're just going to, we're doing a very strict regime that like designed for like 18, 19, 20 year olds when they get more specialist. But kids need generalization. They need to be like, they need to look, like you said, they need to look far away. They need to look close. They need to use the peripheral vision. They need to be challenged to jump over random things and under things and create like really re weird, like, like you know what random you do when you're a kid? Yeah. Jack of all trades, yeah. a master of none, just diversity. I, I guess I'm not knocking the system that we live in because we still, if we're honest, we still live in Sydney and we still have, if you look at most people's weeks, it is quite regimented. Yeah. Um, it's slowly changing by the looks of it with um, people having the opportunity to stay at home, go to work, having that flexibility, which is amazing for a lot of people with low back um, problems. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm not def definitely not knocking that um, you shouldn't have structure in your life. Um, but there needs to be almost that balance where you do have the ability to move around and, and take all your joints into different ranges. Um, and I guess that's what's great about training. It's almost like that you you should be for this hour taking your joints into mm. those ranges I agree totally. and having Long that yeah. um, routinely done, rhythmically done, because you do it once, it's not going to do anything. If you do it rhythmically, mm. then your body changes its malleability. It changes its neurology. Um, and that's how I approach it even with the chiropractic. It, there's a rhythm to the adjustment um, to make long-term changes. I'm not in um, for like just short-term quick fixes because if we're all honest, that, that doesn't exist. Mm. There is no silver bullet to um, getting someone healthier on their back. It's, it's about rhythm. It's about um, intentionality um, and just uh, having the right advice from great coaches and great practitioners. That's great. I want to say this before too. Something I really like about your process is we already talked about how you capture someone's data. You like an x-ray, you kind of look at the pelvis, rib cage, foot positions, all that sort of stuff. And then you use that as your reference point for your adjustments. And then you have your follow-up and you can see your initial changes. I just think that is such a better practice than, than what's done mainly out there. Because you've got a template to use. You can see what your changes are creating. And a plan, and, right? And yeah. A, yeah. And there's a plan going forward as and, well, which is when we first opened Benchmark, we actually went to loads of different places. Oh, God. And this there's is quackery, um, quackery out there. Yeah. And when we went to all these different places, no one had a plan. Like people, some people just lay you down and just do stuff to you. Here's my and routine. And what we always really appreciate and thought was so incredible about what you do, and that's why we recommend our members to go to you, is because you 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 have you have principles, you you guide, you have a process. You look at what they do, and then you you make adjustments as 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 you go. And it's something that really really lacks in the industry, which is kind of scary. Yeah, it wow. is massively. And uh, thank you for that. Um, truly appreciate it, and I guess that's why I've in the last six years gone back to teaching is because I saw that um, there was just too much randomness. Yeah, yeah. And um, too much, um, we're going to quick fix someone's health when we know that it's not possible. So um, I guess I learned this from my own scar tissue of being one of those practitioners. And um, you only know what you know at the time and you can only do the best that you can when you do. And um, it just gets to a point where you're like, am I actually making true change? And I'm one of those people that are a little bit more analytical. I'm like, I want to see that I'm actually making a difference. I want to check in with that patient. So I've definitely come across people that um, they've been with a practitioner and they're just, I, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a chronic pain. I don't know if I'm getting, I, I generally, like you have to marry the subjective and the objective findings together and just making sure that it actually makes sense. So and I guess I that's where we come from. I think that provides comfort to the client as well to go, oh, okay, they've captured this data. They've given me a plan. They've given me security in this. I have a left and right of arc to operate in. I feel good. I feel robust. I feel strong rather than, oh, it's this random thing. Oh, no, your back's really bad. You probably shouldn't do A, B, and C. You are A, providing them with objective data and B, using empowering language to hopefully get these guys feeling the strongest version of themselves within their own body and progressing with their treatment plan. That, that's 100% what we aim to do for every single person that comes through our doors. We, we um, just had a member come in the other day. I just, this is the oh, last yeah. one. No, you, can, you can jump on this if you want. But um, 
they, they went to see a GP about their back, and um, the GP literally had a stick, like a um, like a lolly stick, yeah. on her like on her table. And she goes, "Well, this at the moment, this is your back, and this is what could happen to your back." <laughs> that's oh, the, it's that's oh, it in front of her. And we're like, oh God, is this this? And we hear this, we actually hear this happen so much. So Mitch was talking about like empowering language and the way you you, you personally, Paula, um, deal with people is is such a like it's something that sadly isn't enough in the in, in the industry. Yeah. Um, what do you what, what what we haven't got long, but what do you personally think about when you hear when you hear stuff like that going on in um in the industry? Uh, I'll be very careful because one of my best friends is the GP. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, but it's, it's I, not to, and I appreciate it's not all the work do, they do. Um, oh yeah, GPs are fantastic. Yeah. They do do a lot. Um, but uh, where I come from is the way that you communicate to someone can be as impactful as the therapy that you course, yeah. that you administer. Hundred yeah, percent. So um, with everyone on our team, we're very conscious about the language we use around pain. Because we know that if we if we use certain language, then research says that that person is just going to get worse. Even showing someone's X-ray could potentially get them worse if you're not careful about it, and just because of the way that someone perceives something. So we're very careful in making sure that our language is empowering, that our language um, means that that person will take positive steps, and we're very careful in just making sure that. Um, yeah, all of that happens. But yeah, using the words broken, and that's happened a lot. Or well, snapping um, something. Or snap, yeah. yeah. So I've, I've had a few patients come through the doors, unfortunately, and they're like, oh, um, I was told it's broken. And then I'd look at their x-ray, I'm like, which part? And I'm like, I can't see it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like, one, show, one that show, me, show me. This is the worst I've seen. Oh, no. And like, oh, oh that is so. not doing any justice to the person there. And, that is and, sad. And the way that I see it is that um, if someone – if someone's walking through my doors, um, they already took the hardest step. It is, it is a, it's a lot for someone to put up their hand and say, I need help. And the last thing I need to do is shame them. Yeah. yeah. Um, we're just going to run out of time, unfortunately. But this has been fantastic. And we really appreciate you joining us today, Paula. Thank you for your time. Yeah, thank, thank you, you for having me. This was fun. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Something to do again in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks for joining us today.